Thank you, Dr. Bald, for the introduction and the invitation to Texas Tech. A look around the world in 2015 reveals that among the most common shared baggage that clutters the closets of our global village are innu innumerable gear tags filled with sports of all sorts. To claim that sports represents, alongside blue jeans, cell phones, SUVs, and pop music, something essential about the much contested term globalization requires almost no defense. But since I'm an academic, I feel compelled to provide one anyway. The humorous and diehard Philadelphia sports fanatic Joe Queenan, in his hilarious recent meditation on the universal nature of modern fandom, true believers, the tragic inner life of sports fans, recalls how his turn to psychotherapy to cure his rabid sports addiction came to a sudden end. He confessed to his counselor that a gut-wrenching loss by the Philadelphia 76ers had ruined his weekend and pushed him into a thick depression. His less than empathetic uh, analyst uh, told him that he was stupid for letting a basketball game control his psychic universe. Queen and then recounted the culmination of his psychotherapy experience. <laughs> what sort of thing would ruin your weekend, I, I inquired. What sort of thing do you care about? He had his answer already. Well, the destruction of the rainforest or global warming or something like that, not a basketball game. It was clear that our therapeutic liaison had reached a serious uh, impasse. Stiffening, I stared at him with an expression of infinite contempt. How could you possibly compare the fate of the rainforest to the fate of the Philadelphia 76ers? I said, you need to get your priorities straight. Change the team from the 76ers to Manchester United or Real Madrid in soccer, or to the Bangalore Brigadiers or Peshawar Royal Kings in cricket, or to the Carlton Magpies or Sydney Swans in Australian rules football, or even, to the Nittany Lions or Red Raiders in American intercollegiate sport, and fans around the world clearly share Queen and sentiments. Much to the chagrin of the world's tree huggers, enthusiasm for the salvation of rainforest pales in comparison to the global passion for sport. Sporting fever, not shared fewer over the fate of Brazilian hardwoods, seems to be the crucial social epoxy that bonds the global village into a community of shared interests. A variety of data support this claim. Ponder the fact that sports provides the world with its most common and its broadest shared experiences in the form of Olympic and World Cup television broadcasts that draw as many as five billion viewers. I can add a personal anecdote to buttress this claim. That, to buttress the claim that sport provides sinews for a robust global culture. As an American who has been lucky enough to travel abroad extensively, I have never felt more acutely a stranger in a strange land than during the month I spent in Japan lecturing at a dozen universities, ironically, about the history of sport in American culture. During the second week of my Japanese immersion, Feeling like a giant bearded barbarian escaped from a circus freak show after yet another day of quizzical stares from my fellow travelers on jam-packed rush hour Tokyo subways, I was, whisked, I was whisked away by my host to a traditional mountain village a couple of hours away from urban Tokyo to recover my sanity. He took me there to be a guest of honor at a college football game played in the Japanese football, American variety, Hall of Fame. His institution, Musashi University, played Japanese powerhouse Rikia University in the annual Hall of Fame game. Before the trip, I had no idea that Japanese universities played American football. While in the bucolic mountains, I discovered that an Anglican missionary from Kentucky named Paul Rush um, introduced the sport to Japan when in 1925 the YMCA sent him to the land of the rising sun to help with recovery efforts following the devastation of the great Tokyo earthquake. Rush spent decades in Japan, both before and after the Second World War, and in addition to introducing American football, he was instrumental in preserving a traditional Japanese farming village. 
in the mountains of uh, Yamanashi Prefecture as a living museum for the enlightenment of what has become the most urban culture on planet Earth. The Japanese American Football Hall of Fame is located, ironically, on the Arcadian grounds of the Farm Preserve, a most bizarre conjunction of Japanese tradition and American modernity. As a visiting dignitary from Penn State uh, in the pre-Sandusky scandal era, when I visited, uh, my employer was a more pristine symbol of the power of college football and American higher education, I was treated as if I were an A-list celebrity. Among the many strange and wonderful experiences I had that weekend was a visit from the coaching staff of Rikyo University who confessed to me in tearful detail that they had modeled their program down to the blue and white uniforms without the names of the players on their backs and the white helmets without logos on Penn State's iconic haberdashery, which we've since changed. Uh, that they thought Joe Paterno was among the greatest heroes ever to walk the planet and that their favorite movie was uh, Something for Joe, the saccharine made-for-TV biopic about Penn State's only Heisman winner, John Capaletti, and his, his leukemia uh, uh, doomed younger brother. Pulling out a worn, vi a worn video of the film, they lamented that they could not find an ancient VCR able to play it, so we could all watch together, but asked me to sign the box cover a shrine already decorated with the John Hancocks of several Penn State legends, including Joe Paterno's. I had not the heart to tell them that I consider Something for Joy one of the most maudlin sports movies of all times, <laughs> that my college football fandom centers on the mediocre New Mexico Lobos and the Arizona Wildcats who play where I spent the formative years of my childhood and young adulthood, that I was deeply suspicious of the cult of Joe Paterno uh, that flourished in Happy Valley, and that as a mere professor, I had nothing to do with Penn State football other than going to an occasional game. I just scrawled my name illegible, illegibly onto the cover near Paterno's very recognizable uh, signature. At that moment, I became a true believer that as the, the, the tune that echoes endlessly at Disneyland reminds us all, it is indeed a small world after all. And there I am in the upper right. Uh, Musashi, the university my host uh, um, worked at, was killed by Rikio. And you can see I'm a little bit bigger than most of their players, and they, I think, were thinking about putting me in at the end of the game. <laughs> Thankfully, they didn't. I trust that I have now convinced you that sport plays a powerful role in the contemporary, if imaginary, village that sig signifies globalization and that I can now move on to more controversial and more important arguments. So let's stipulate that sport is the glue that binds the small world together and look beyond uh, to just what sort of small world sport creates. In tackling this question, I want to make and defend four assertions. In historical terms, modern sports are unquestionably the cultural plot product of Western civilization. The classical Greek culture of antiquity serves as the muse that animates much of our adoration of sport as a crucial political and social institution. Modern sport, however, emerged from quite different shores than the Mediterranean strands of Greece, at least the modern version of the sport. Modern sports originated not in a generic modern West, but in a specific place and time in the English-speaking world during the industrial, technological, and political revolutions of the 17th, 18th, and uh, 19th centuries that provided the infrastructure for modernity. Great Britain, the imperial dominions and colonies, and even the breakaway realm of the United States represent ground zero for the invention of modern sport. The spread of modern sports from, Ang uh, from the Anglo-American world to the rest of the globe uh, swept the sporting traditions of non-Western cultures into the dustbins of history. Modern Anglo-American sports emerged out of the same social locations and intellectual factories that produced modern liberal ideas about government, politics, economic relations, and human nature. The, the voluntary associations that incubated liberals, salons and Sunday schools, coffee houses and taverns, Reading clubs and civic fraternities also created modern sports. 
the same newspapers and magazines, monographs and novels that made the ideas of these associations part of the public atmosphere of the West also promoted and popularized modern sports. Western ideas about civic virtue in its classical formulation or social capital, as contemporary scholars now describe this force, are inextricably embedded in modern sports. Modern sports rapidly spread from the Anglo-American, from their Anglo-American homelands and from the glacial perspectives of the long durée, instantaneously conquered the globe. In the process, the idea that sports produces social capital generates moral virtue and provides narratives that animate the bonds of national identity uh, also spread rapidly around the globe and were as important, if not more significant, than the sports themselves. These four assertions raise what I think are four important questions. Does the spread of modern sports around the world and the ubiquity of modern sports in global culture actually make the global village a more Western bird? Are modern sports actually instruments of Westernization? Given the historic ties between modern sports and Western liberalism, including the belief that sporting activities can create social capital, the constitutionalist analogies between writing rules for sporting contests and writing rules for politics, the tensions between individual success and communal achievement built into the structure of both team sports and liberal ideologies. Are modern sports vehicles for liberalization in both the West and the world? In contrast to the second query, does the historical reality that modern sports have flourished in all sorts of modern nations, totalitarian, fascist, and communist, as well as liberal, mean that they are so plastic and adaptable that they do not carry the cultural patterns of their make, that their makers insisted they possess to other societies and civilizations? What impact has the spread of modern sport had on the global village? Does it provide, like the evolution of modern cuisines, a non-ideological veneer of globalization without much impact on deeper social structures? Or does sport contain the possibilities for making more profound impacts and transformations? My first two assertions contend that the origins of modern sport are Western, or more precisely, Anglo-American. So let's take a close look at the most popular sport in the world, nature both by participation and spectatorship, soccer, or what the rest of the world outside the United States calls football. Scholars and chauvinists periodically claim dubious historic connections between football and the ancient practices of Chinese or Mesoamerican or Roman civilization. But football modern football was clearly the invention of 19th century Britons, who wrote the rules for and patronized two basic football codes, association football and rugby football. Resistance to the essential Britishness of these games in other parts of the English-speaking world led to the adaptation of the original codes into new branches uh, of the British trunk, including the American vari variant of gridiron football that emerged from rugby, as well as the British resistant hybrids uh, in Australian rules football, Canadian football, and Ireland's particularly anti-British strain of Gaelic football. The British Empire, the most powerful institution in the world in the 19th and early 20th centuries, exported varieties of football to the globe where they fell on fertile soil, except in the U.S. and Ireland, where the invasion of British seas provoked resistant native limbs. No traces of ancient Celtic, Frankish, or Roman sports, or Chinese, Mesoamerican, or Incan games that resembled football remained anywhere on the globe in the 19th century when Pax Britannica began shipping its football imports to global markets. The global diffusion of soccer reveals an illuminating pattern. 
Lacking their own traditional ball games, the elites of Europe, Latin America, Asia, and Africa initially gravitated toward soccer uh, as part of an emulative ritual designed to capture, through the imitation of British lifestyles, some of the magic that they thought the British Empire possessed. Not because they believed the game would resurrect the spirits of their ancestral civilizations. From the elites, football soon spread to the masses and became the world's game. Whether or not they want to admit it, and many do not, the German, French, and Italian, Brazilian, Argentine, and Mexican, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese, Nigerian, uh, Ghanaian, and Cote d'Ivorian devotees of soccer football love the British invention. One that some scholarly wax have labeled the British Empire's most enduring export. Well, a clever member of the audience might ask at this juncture, I will grant you that varieties of football, from British soccer to American football, uh, that you witness in Japan are clearly exports from the Anglo-American universe. But that hardly exhausts the nearly endless list of modern sports. What about modern sports that seem not to be specific inventions by particular nations, such as football, but rather the products of long evolutions that hint at some underlying universality of human physical culture, running and jumping and throwing contests, or combat sports, such as uh, um, uh, boxing and wrestling, that we could argue can be found at all places in all times in human history. I admit that's a fair question. And I will also concede that these sports do have some universal dimensions. I would argue, though, that in their modern forms, as track and field, as boxing and wrestling, these sports clearly show the indelible imprint of Anglo-American cultures. The events that now regular, regularly appear in modern track and field meets emerge out of the running and jumping and throwing games produced by early modern English-speaking cultures, augmented by a few events such as the discus and javelin, uh, inspired by Anglo-American obsessions in that era with the sports of the ancient Greeks. Though the distances of running events have been globalized in meters rather than in, original, uh, in their original English measurements, they remain faithful to the varying test of speed and endurance first created by British athletic modernizers. One can make the same case about modern combat sports, especially about boxing, which have, thor which have in fact thoroughly British origins. If one surveys the historic program of the modern Olympics, a supposedly global festival of athletic endeavor, almost every sport on the docket has a Western and mainly a British origin. One exception, judo proves the rule, as the old adage goes. Judo debuted as an Olympic sport in 1964 at Tokyo, seemingly a move by the Eurocentric International Olympic Committee to match and practice the global rhetoric it regularly espoused. Modern judo clearly originated not in Great Britain, but in Japan, invented in 1882 by Jigoro Kano, the first Asian member of the International Olympic Committee, on the carcass of older Japanese martial arts tradition. Kano, educated in English schools in Japan and imbued with the British public schoolboy ethic that held that sporting experiences provided the essential ingredients for the making of modern nationhood and modern manhood, and imbued with the westernizing spirit adopted by Japanese leaders during the modernization campaign sparked by the Meiji Restoration, replicated the Anglo-American process of modernizing traditional sports into modern forms as he invented Judo. Despite its Japanese nomenclature and roots, Kano produced a combat sport that reproduced all the essential modern elements of Western culture, as the British inventors of modern boxing had done with pugilism a couple of centuries earlier. More recent additions of Eastern martial arts on the Olympic program manifest the similar pattern, with a veneer of traditional Asian trappings over an essentially modernized and westernized core that rationalizes, secularizes, and specializes these older contests of combat prowess. To rationalization, secularity, and specialization, 
I would add another essential element of modern sport, equality. In following a neo-Weberian model outlined by one of the preeminent scholars of modern sport, Alan Gutman. Gutman has argued that modern sports manifest the fetish for equality in two distinctive ways equality of the opportunity to compete, and equality of the conditions of competition. From Gutman's vantage, modern sports, at least in the idealized sense, promote equality of opportunity to compete. Athletic ability, and not ethnic origin or religious persuasion, or any other social category, should serve as the determining factor in who gets to compete from the modern perspective. Hence, the vast majority of moderns were appalled by the refusal of an Iranian judoka to grapple with an Israeli opponent at the 2004 Athens Olympics. Hence, when Kano invented judo, he opened it to the world rather than trying to make it the sole property of Japan. Hence, the eventual inclusion in 1992 of women in Olympic judo contests. The modern fetish for equality of the opportunity to compete was not something inherited from traditional sporting cultures or even from the ancient Greeks. In the classical Greek version of the Olympics, they excluded not only women, but anyone who was not Greek until the Roman conquest of Greece forced a more pan-ethnic inclusion of Roman seekers of Greek Olympian glory, most notoriously, if you know your ancient Olympic history, the Emperor Nero. Goodman notes that equally important in modern forms of sport to the principle of equality of opportunity to compete is a focus on the equality of the conditions of competition. Traditional forms of sport never required equal numbers of players on each side or even a level playing field as some games were literally played uphill, a practice that in modern sport is confined mainly to metaphoric excuse making now so rife in the whiny post-game press conferences of losing coaches. Modern rule makers write equality of the conditions of competition into the very fabric of their written rule sets, making it a standard uh, rubric of modern contests that have turned the metaphor of a level playing field into a cherished feature of our sporting practice. Curiously, the emphasis on establishing equality of the conditions of competition through written documents resides at the very British center of the invention of modern sports. This form of rationalization emerged in order to protect the viability of gambling in horse racing and in other sports. British legal records from the 17th and 18th centuries are littered with horse racing contracts prize fighting contracts, cricket match contracts, and yacht regatta contracts designed to ensure equality of the conditions of competition and protect the sporting interests of gamblers. As an irrational economic behavior produced the rationalization that modernized sports. Those contracts signal the first stirrings of the rationalization of modern sport as the game makers and lawyers who drew the contracts push towards constructing standardized, universal rules for the governance of human behavior in sport and in all other realms of human endeavor. Similar trends inspired by the spirit of rationalization suffuse the, the birth of, modern, of the modern liberal world, as the German philosopher of modernity, Jürgen Habermas, has detailed. The irony is too delicious to ignore. Voluntary associations of gamblers, united by their common interests in particular sports and in, the broader, in their broader lust for wagering, created modern sports by forming clubs of like-minded brethren. The jockey club for the equestrian set, the royal yacht club for wealthy sailors, the pugilistic club for the patrons of boxing, uh, the Marley Moon Cricket Club for the, official, for the aficionados of team sports. They wrote constitutional-like rule books and defined the rights and privileges of their members, whom they drew from the aristocracy and the gentry, but also and increasingly from the rising middle classes who favored equality of the opportunity to consort with like-minded individuals. The membership of those sporting clubs intersected with all 
the other associations sprouting in the fecund social uh, soil of early modern Western societies. Groups ardently wedded to the principle of free assembly and associated with the other great liberal trends of the epoch, including the veneration of republics, the con construction of constitutions and other legal codes to limit arbitrary power and the free exchange of ideas. Small wonder then that the inventors of modern sport who inhabited the Anglo-American universe of voluntary associations and Republican ideology linked their games to other crucial components of Western liberal tradition. Small wonder as well that the uh, Marlebone Cricket Club called its rule, rule set the Laws of Cricket, a name that endures to this day. The iconoclastic historian Niall Ferguson in his provocative empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, captures this connection between sport and the liberal tradition in his list of what he calls distinctive features that Anglo-American civilization disseminated to the globe. An inventory that ranks team sports alongside the common law, the limited or night watchman state, representative assemblies, and the idea of liberty as the key ingredients that forged modernity. Having introduced sports to the argument, Ferguson disappointingly fails to follow through in his 400-page tome with even a cursory explanation of how and where team sports fit into that history uh, of the making of the modern world. Uh, fortunately, we can turn for lessons in the linkage between team sports and printing social capital to a once grand but now forgotten uh, now neglected work of English literature. Tom Brown Schools, a lovely novel by the Victorian co-founder of the YMCA, Thomas Hughes, first appeared in 1857, became an instant hit, and then enjoyed a century of prominence on bestseller lists, spawning the genre of boarding school coming of age tales that has produced both the sublime Lord of the Flies and the ludicrous but better selling Harry Potter series. Sorry if you're a fan. <laughs> Rugby School serves as the setting for Tom Brown's tale, as well as the uh, as well as the football code that emerged there and spread throughout the empire. Hughes offers a dazzling deconstruction of a rugby football game, as well as enchanting descriptions of cross-country foot races handball games, boxing matches, and other primal elements of modern sporting practice. But his most telling passages come near the climax of the tale as he brilliantly captures the idea that modern sport and modern liberalism work hand in glove. To set the scene, Tom and his classmates play a cricket match against the venerable uh, Marlebone Cricket Club a team that has since 18, 1787, as I mentioned, uh, ruled the game worldwide through the laws of cricket. Chosen by his peers as the captain of rugby's cricket squad for the match against the MCC, an honor that makes him the leader of his teammate, teammates in the contest against the most famous team in the world, Tom engages in a conversation about the merits of cricket with his best friend, Arthur, and with one of their teachers. The teacher, new to the intricate rules and tactics of the game, observes to Tom and Arthur that cricket is a truly magnificent spectacle. The boys reply to their teacher, isn't it? But it's more than a game. It's an institution, said Tom. Yes, said Arthur, the birthright of British boys, old and young, as habeas corpus and trial by jury are of British men. From Tom Brown, as well as from his non-fictional fellow Britons who ruled the 19th century's most powerful empire, sports were far more than mere games. Sports served as tools for teaching men, and a few Victorians insisted women, the skills necessary to thrive in a modern society. Sports represented one of the key institutions for building a stable, prosperous, and dynamic nation. Sport had become a birthright, something that should be freely guaranteed to all citizens of modern nations. From this perspective, among the rights protected by constitutions were not only such legal guarantees as habeas corpus and trial by jury and the other 
fundamental political and personal liberties enshrined in the British, U.S., and other constitutions, such as freedom of speech and freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, and freedom to assemble, but a birthright guarantee to freely engage in sport. Inspired by such notions, Theodore Roosevelt, arguably the most important figure in the spread of American beliefs, that sport generated social capital, famously proclaimed Tom Brown School Days as one of the two books that every boy should read. The idea that sports were not just games, but a critical institution in the modern world quickly moved beyond the borders of the English-speaking world. The novel captured the imagination of a minor French nobleman, the Baron Pierre de Courton, and inspired his creation of the most significant international sporting event in the world in world history, the renovated Olympic Games, an institution that would spread around the world the idea that sports served as a crucial element in the creation of modern civilization. Translated into Japanese, Tom Brown School Days transported the idea to Japan during the Meiji Restoration, where Jigoro Kano read it numerous times and discovered his inspiration for the invention of judo. By the early 20th century, the idea that sport represented more than mere games, uh, but embodied essential ingredients of Western liberalism, had become a truism in the emerging global village. In the century since, the idea has continued to grow and evolve. This idea, however, raises important questions about contemporary hot-button issues in history and other social sciences regarding the nature and structure of globalization, westernization, modernization, and related concepts. Few would dispute the notion that the idea that sport nurtures the development of social capital has become a powerful global belief. Measuring the impact of this idea on the lived experience of billions of people who inhabit the planet, however, is a considerable challenge. Have modern sports made the global village more Western and more liberal in any meaningful way? Or did they merely signal a thin veneer, thin veneer of Western liberal glaze on cultures and civilizations that are profoundly different? like the black market blue jeans sported by guards in the old Soviet gulags, or the laptops that cluttered Osama bin Laden's lair, or the alleged devotion to NBA basketball of North Korean and Korea's supreme leader. Let me take the cynical side first and point to some strong evidence that modern sports seems, seem to be mere guild on the lily, uh, or more guild than lily more a facade than a formula for the inculcation of ideas. For more than a century, sports have flourished not only in nations, uh, in the nations of the liberal West, but in almost every other political and social arrangement in the world. As the adoration of Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and even Dennis Rodman by North Korea's Supreme Leader betrays. A list of the global sporting powers in the 20th century includes not only liberal democracies, but all manner of authoritarian regimes. In the 1930s, totalitarian regimes in Germany, Japan, and Italy built and maintained powerful sports machines, winning Olympic medals, World Cup titles, and a host of other accolades. In the Cold War that followed, the Soviets and their client states, as well as Mao's China, demonstrated that totalitarian sports systems could generally be the best teams the West could field in all sorts of sports as Cuban baseball, East German swimming, Romanian gymnastics, and Soviet hockey reveal. The occasional miracle on ice or some other playing surface uh, were mere anomalies. Hence our astonishment in the West at their rare appearances. Add to this compelling data from the Soviet era, the corollary evidence that soccer teams from military dictatorships in Latin America and Africa have routinely bested their liberal rivals, and uh, one wonders about uh, the liberal power of sport in the world. Consider also the totalitarian devotion to modern that totalitarian devotion to modern sport seems not to have undermined non-democratic regimes, nor sown the seeds of social capital necessary to foment le liberal revolutions, as the 21st century rise of China in global sport seems to confirm. 
Modern sports have, from this litany, an entire have been an entirely plastic artifact that can be molded to the contours of any culture or ideology. Sport viewed from this angle imparts to illiberal cultures nothing of the shape or character of its liberal inventors. To that gloomy assessment of the power of sport as a liberalizing force, let me add an internal critique. Even a cursory survey of the role of sport in Western liberal societies reveals that it has not always functioned as a fulcrum for generating the sort of social capital that nurtures healthy democracies. Sporty cultures that produce racist, misogynist, and violent subcommunities. In the West, from the tribes of soccer hooligans who roam the landscapes of urban Europe to the occasionally overzealous celebrants of college sports in the United States who periodically riot on campuses. Sport in contemporary Western culture seems as likely to nurture greed, self-absorption, and an excessive sense of entitlement as to promote teamwork, altruism, and humility. Anyone who has ever spent even the briefest time immersed in the rabid culture of child and youth sports that infects large swaths of the United States has to have wondered whether the excessive interest and energy spent by the adults involved in these endeavors might not be better directed toward expanding public literacy or cultivating a love of academic pursuits instead of creating ever more travel teams to conquer rival communities in soccer or swimming or a myriad of other athletic pursuits. I have four children between the ages of nine and 15 and am thereby currently and inexorably immersed in the tidal vortex of this juvenile sports world. And there's number three, daughter, uh, looks like her mother, plays a lot better uh, for those of you that knew Joey. My experiences are that travel teams and high school rivalries do not generally invoke the angels of our better natures. Do not routinely unite our overindulged selves in the service of larger causes, and do not consistently unleash the sort of social capital that dem democratic theorists have insisted lubricates healthy societies. <clears throat> Lest the melancholy pall cast by these facts make the ideas espoused by Tom Brown's school days into syrupy nonsense, can we find any evidence that modern sports have at some times and in some places contributed to the liberation of peoples or cultures, or at least offered some limited subsidies to the development of wholesome social capital? I have a personal as well as an intellectual interest in this question, caught as I am in my parental entanglements in our contemporary juvenile sports world. My wife a remarkably agile and deep thinker, owing no doubt to the master's and doctoral degrees in history that she earned from Texas Tech, considers the long-standing modern idea that sports builds character for individuals and cultures as pernicious nonsense. The self-serving sophistry of the global job actors. To travel teams and 6 a.m. shoot-arounds for teenage basketball players she prefers more focus on reading, writing, and arithmetic, more interested in piano lessons, marching band practice, the high, and high school musicals. She has even publicly wondered whether the aforementioned excessive interest and energy spent by the adults and children involved in youth sports might not actually be better directed toward cultivating literacy or spreading the love of learning. It is not that I entirely disagree with her logic when she launches these anti-sporting jeremiads in the stands at my son's and daughter's basketball and soccer games that I, am, that I non verbally communicate to my fellow parents that her philosophy is indeed the cute and quaint ravings of someone who just doesn't get sports. But my desire not to be sentenced with her to the island of misfits parents who are not totally on board with the 110% gung-ho belief that sports have always been and will ever be a fountain of unadulterated goodness for all involved. When she goes to the concession stand after loudly observing that perhaps many of the teenagers who show up at 6 a.m. for the voluntary workouts to show their dedication to the team would be better served by early morning mathematics lessons, especially her eldest son, my fellow team parents comment quietly to me that my spouse holds 
interesting views. I reply in my favorite sports center vapidity, it is what it is. She did not make the trip to Lubbock with me, but I confess she deserves a better answer, a better response than it is what it is. So, can I give one? Have sports at some times and, and in some places contributed to the liberation of peoples and cultures. In a 2012 study entitled Sport and Democracy in the Ancient and Modern Worlds, the Dartmouth University classics, uh, a classicist Paul Christensen argues that, sport, uh, that the spread of sport beyond the realms of the elite and into the lives of the masses in both ancient Greece and in modern Anglo-American worlds represents on balance the spread of democratic and egalitarian sentiments and institutions in both ancient and modern cultures. Christensen wisely warns that we not conflate this correlation with causation, but he does contend that the flowering of mass sport in both Plato and Aristotle's Athens, in Tom Brown's Great Britain, and in Teddy Roosevelt's United States contributed to the democratization of these societies. Christensen is not alone in arguing that the societal bonds produced by mass engagement in sport fuel the democratization and liberalization of societies. The Harvard political theorist Robert Putnam has made similar arguments, resurrecting like Christensen the spirit of Alexis de Tocqueville's quest to unravel the riddle of democracy in America and spread it and, and everywhere else by focusing on the common habits of everyday people. Putnam's provocatively titled Bowling Alone, evoking the specter of a lone and alienated bowler, replacing earlier generations of socially engaged devotees of the lanes, who routinely knock down pens as members of democratic and egalitarian bowling teams bonded through their sharing of both the love of their sport and their affinity for wearing ideal, identically hideous shirts, also persuasively argues that engagement in mass sports fuels democracy or at least bowling teams did that in the past before we all dropped out of our civic engagements and retreated into narcissistic privacy in order to watch sports on television. Putnam and Christensen's work rescue sport as a tool for increasing the flows of social capital and for undertaking democratic and egalitarian projects. Approaching democratization and, liberal and, 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 and liberation from a slightly different angle, one could also point to the role of sport in um, embodying liberal ideals that have sometimes led, rather than just reflected, campaigns for social justice, in particular campaigns for racial equality. The late American historian Jules Tigell's masterful baseball's great experiment, Jackie Robinson and his legacy, definitely illustrates to readers that our mass adoration of sport should not lead to overstatements about the power of national pastimes to change society, and that Major League Baseball did not magically banish segregation and racism from American culture in one triumphal swing of the bat that crushed Jim Crow by a grand slam. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Tigell portrays Robinson's lonely journey to test the proposition of whether an institution populated by large numbers of whites who were openly hostile to integration could have even limited success as a crucial early step in the civil rights movement. Tigell reminds us in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War that sport led the way toward social change that Robinson des desegregated the Dodgers before Harry Truman desegregated the U.S. military, before the Supreme Court paved the way toward the dismantling of legal segregation, before the citizen armies of the civil rights movement mounted their sustained campaigns against the citadels of racial exclusion. With the whole world watching, Robinson and his supporters launched the most public and visible campaign to achieve the great experiment yet attempted at that time. Similar histories of the role of sport in launching great experiments in other nations driven by racial and ethnic discrimination and in search of more democratic and egalitarian relations remain to be written. I hope to see a definitive study of the role of Edson Arantes do Nascimento, better known to the world as Pelé in the history of Brazil appear in my lifetime. 
One great exception to my claim about the general lack of histories on the role of sport in cultivating racial justice and political liberation in nations beyond the United States stands as my last and I think best argument that modern sport has in fact served at times as a vehicle for building a Western and liberal foundation for our global village. In 1963, Cyril Lionel Robert James published Beyond a Bound, the best meditation on the meaning of sport in modern culture since 1857 when Thomas Hughes crafted Tom Brown Schools. Born in 1901 in Trinidad, C.L.R. James witnessed much of the history of the 20th century, passing away in 1989. James is now generally considered among academics as the grandfather of post-colonial subaltern and pan-African studies. Schools of thought not usually considered friendly to westernization or to the modern liberal tradition. James did embrace Marxism early in his intellectual career and remained an ardent believer throughout his life, espousing an idealistic and romantic strain of that ideology grounded in a humanistic attraction to radical egalitarianism. James wrote extensively about a wide variety of topics, from Herman Melville's Moby Dick to Toussaint Leover towards Haitian Revolution. He engaged deeply in struggles for racial equality in the British Empire and the rest of the world, and lobbied strenuously for the independence of colonial states from Western imperialism, in particular for the freedom of his beloved West Indies from British dominion. A careful reading of James' many works reveals that while he was a committed critic of Western imperialism and Western hegemony, he was a great admirer of Western civilization and of the concepts of self-determination, constitutionalism, democracy, free speech, and free association. He also loved sports, especially team sports, and most especially cricket. James' title, Beyond a Boundary, derives in part from a cricket term that describes the grandest hit a cricket batter can make, the rough equivalent of a grand slam home run in baseball, um, hitting the ball beyond a boundary, and in part from the metaphor for the quest to move past the many boundaries, racial and political and social, that limited human prospects. He chronicles the transcendence of those boundaries through his masterpiece while maintaining cricket at the center of his narrative. Unlike many of his uh, Marxist intellectual fellow travelers who dismiss modern sport as a bourgeois con concocted opiate of the masses, James loved sports and considered it an essential vehicle for both personal and social liberation. In the pages of Beyond a Boundary, a book that intermixes memoir, manifesto, and an extended defense of the role of sport in creating the conditions for liberation, James reveals himself as a black-skinned colonial version of Tom Brown, sent by his aspiring middle-class family to a West Indian version of a British public school where he blithely ignored his schoolmates' attempts at formal, uh, schoolmaster's attempts at formal academic inculcation but fell deeply and permanently in love with British school. On the cricket oval and on the soccer pitch, he felt the Western ideals of democracy and equality, such as respect for law and fealty to the commonweal, that his tutors touted in arid schoolroom lectures become tangible and electric verities. Team sports in general, and cricket in particular, provided him with an education in the caste and color boundaries that clogged modern societies and equipped him with a language and metaphors he needed to make the case for West Indian independence to the white power structures of the British Empire. To those who would not countenance sharing power with black majorities and would not hear the case for West Indian independence, he offered a classic British repost. It isn't cricket, he insisted, condemning the inherent injustice of refusals to prevent self-government by the world's great apostles of self-government as the fundamental perversion of, of justice and that such hypocrisy represented. <clears throat> Prefiguring the work of contemporary scholars such as Paul Christensen and Robert Putnam by four decades, James asserted a history of modernity in which the flowering of widespread and popular adoration of sports 
in the Anglo-American world, and then around the rest of the globe since the middle of the 19th century, correlated with the emergence of modern democratic movements, even if a direct causal link was not evident. James contended that, quote, the same public that wanted sports and games so eagerly wanted popular democracy too. Perhaps they were not exactly the same people in each case. Even so, both groups were stirred at the same time, end quote. James also linked the connections between modern sport and democracy back to classical Greece. The Greek lamp burns today as steadily as ever, James proclaimed. They who laid the intellectual foundations of the Western world were the most fanatical players and organizers of games that the world has ever seen. As James fought for popular democracy in the West Indies, he became deeply involved in the crusade to appoint an Afro-Caribbean player as the captain of the national cricket team. James understood and detested the long tradition of restricting the captaincy of racially mixed West Indian national cricket sides solely to whites. Replicate, and that he understood also that it replicated the long history of white elites governing the black masses in the islands. When in 1961, the white old guard that controlled West Indian cricket finally relented and selected the African Caribbean uh, star Frank Worrell as the captain for the national team's tour of Australia, James cheered that he knew West Indian self-government and the victory of popular democracy would soon follow. When a quarter of a million uh, Australians clogged the streets of Melbourne at the conclusion of the cricket tour to offer Worrell and the West Indians a thunderous goodbye, James predicted that sport had inspired a popular democratic spirit in the British Commonwealth that would in due course erase the racial boundaries represented by the white Australia policy and all of the other mechanics of racial exclusion that had long been a part of Britain's imperial project. To a critic who denounced him for allowing cricket to occupy his attention in the midst of these crusades for political and racial justice, James had already retorted. A professor of political science publicly bewailed that a man of my known political interest would believe that cricket had ethical and social values. I had no wish to answer. I just felt sorry for the guy. That snarky response from James brings us back somewhere near to where we began. To Joe Queen and true believers, those billions of sports fans that inhabit the global village. Yes, modern sport contains all sorts of banalities and insipidities. And in the grand scheme of things, we should care about the fate of the rainforest in addition to the fate of our favorite teams. The very fact, however, that such a common phrase as it isn't cricket can instantly convey to billions of fans in every corner of the global village the chronic injustice of racial exclusion or political repression betrays the continuing power of sports to contribute to the evolution of the liberal tradition in the 21st century. Sports holds the power to profoundly impact our social and political understandings of how the global village should operate. It is not just a glossy veneer or mere games, but an institution, the birthright of boys and girls around the world. The phrase, it isn't cricket, has powerful political meanings that reach far beyond the mere confines of playing fields. Of course, the phrase, it, is, it isn't cricket, also betrays the British invention of modern sports. So we can end this lecture where we began. <laughs>